Victor Boot, who was exchanged for Brittany Griner, may be more responsible than any one individual walking planet Earth for violently destabilizing um, Southern Africa um, over the last 20 years. Uh, who knows how much his gun running uh, has cost in uh, black lives. It's evident that he cares. What do you care about? Welcome to The Rock Newman Show. It's The Rock Newman Show. Good evening, folks, and thanks for tuning us in one more time. Um, boy, I've got someone with us tonight that I have wanted to uh, bring to you for a long time. Uh, it is, his name is Kevin Blackstone. He is a, uh, um, a journalism uh, professor uh, at the University of Maryland. He has been on numerous uh, um, sports shows, uh, and, and also they call him as a guest, uh, when there is the intersection of sports and politics, oftentimes, which is oftentimes happens, <laughs> uh, and whether that's MSNBC or, 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 or some of the others, um, also a, uh, an esteemed, um, a columnist whose pieces run in the Washington post. And again, someone who I have admired from, from afar for a long time. Kevin Blackstone, thanks for joining us on the invite. show. Thank 2. you for the This is great. All right. So um, let's jump right in here. Right now, the World Cup is going on in Qatar. Am I saying that right? Qatar, Qatar. Okay. I've heard Qatar, it right. all sorts of ways. Yes. <clears throat> you <clears throat> just wrote a piece. And as far as I'm concerned, it has real historical relevance. At the end of your column, <laughs> you said something to the effect of, insofar as soccer goes, mm -hmm. the colonizers' chickens <laughs> are coming home to roost. Absolutely. Woo, brother, do me a favor. <laughs> Let my audience know what that all means. I read the entire piece and then I read it again. I was like, let me start right there because you just wrote that piece a couple of days ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, uh, uh, just when Morocco broke through and, um, uh, you know, you had six teams in the, in the quarterfinals um, or six teams in the knockout round of 16 um, who were from outside of Europe and outside of uh, South America for the first time. It had never been that many. Mm -hmm. um, and now, obviously, Morocco breaks through, and they're the first uh, African side that will be in the uh, Final Four uh, of the World Cup. And, you know, it's always kind of struck me, you know, I only tune into soccer every four years, really, for the big term. And I watch mm -hmm. a little bit of the Euro when it happens. Um, but in 1998, uh, I was in... Uh, I was in Paris covering the final of that World Cup mm -hmm. um, in Stade de France, which is in a suburb of, of Paris, and uh, France won. And um, France was led by uh, Zidane Zidane, who was Algerian ancestry. Yes. And so we know about the history of Algiers and, 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 and France, and, and getting out of that stadium that night after following a column and everything was like a Mad Max movie trying to get out. Mm -hmm. There were firecrackers going off yeah. all over the place. Yeah. People are driving around, hooping and hollering yeah. because it was an Arab 
suburb. Yeah. And I'm thinking, man, if the Arabs on this French team and the Africans on this French team that helped carry them to this glorious moment mm -hmm. were playing for their ancestral homes rather yeah. than for the country that colonized them and occupied them. I was going to say the colonizers. Right, yeah, exactly. Right. How mm -hmm. strong would those sides be? So now fast forward to 2002, 2022, and we see more and more Africans playing for their African side, whether they were born there or whether they grew up elsewhere and their parents um, were from those countries. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it was, a, it, it, it was a fantastic thing. And it made me think about that um, uh, all over again. And that's why I said that the chickens have come home to roost yeah. because they, have, they may have grown up overseas or yeah. outside of their ancestral home. Mm -hmm. um, they may have grown up in their uh, country in, in Africa, yeah. but have been playing professionally in a European league. Yeah. But they've decided yeah. more and more, yeah. for whatever reasons, yeah. and I hope it's nationalistic reasons, yeah. they're going to play for the home, the home side. Yeah. And, and, great. and what, what Kevin did in that, uh, in that column is he really talked about the history of Europe colonizing yep. and establishing soccer in some of these other places um, for the sake of keeping order. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, this was not a noble <laughs> effort. Yeah. This was a way to, uh, uh, to um, start to steep these other cultures in European aesthetics, European sensibilities, um, all of that. Yeah. Um, they, they, they weren't doing it for any other reason, not for altruistic reasons, but once they found out that this was uh, some real athletic talent yeah. that they were growing, yeah. They begin to harvest it. Yeah. For the European League. That's right. For their national teams. Right. For Italy. For, for, it, for England. For, Eng for France. France. Yes. All yeah. of those. Yes. All those. You know, it, it's so funny because you can watch the, the World Cup, and I think it's even more stark watching the World Cup than even watching the Olympics. But you get a sense of just how broad the African diaspora is. Yeah. When you see brothers playing for Germany, brothers playing for Switzerland. Brother was playing for Switzerland. Um, the opening game against Cameroon, mm -hmm. he scored the first goal and, and, and was, was visibly apologetic mm -hmm. to his Cameroonian brothers for having done that. Yeah. I hope he plays for Cameroon next time. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And so I'm driving. I was driving. Mm -hmm. I had serious MSNBC, mm -hmm. and somebody who I generally like in mm -hmm. terms of how what they do as a broadcaster, mm -hmm. um, um, Ari Melba. Okay, sure. And Ari Melba excitedly talks about Morocco's win, mm -hmm. and then he editorializes that it's the first Arab nation <laughs> to have a victory, whatever that was, uh, quarterfinals right, or right. round eight, what, right. whatever that was. And I pulled over. <laughs> I, I swear to you, Kevin, right. I pulled over, and we can, find, we can verify what day it is, because I put on Facebook, when in the hell, <laughs> when in the hell <laughs> did Morocco, Morocco right. become an Arab country? Right. And it just was such a classic example of how, how people have skewered yeah. thinking and something so good that a phenomenal uh, underdog win right. by Morocco and they become an Arab, an Arab and a resistance, right. a resistance to honor Africa. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, so the World Cup becomes this great educational moment, right? Yes. Right? Because yes. people don't realize that Morocco is actually on the African continent. Yeah. <laughs> they may, Aaron Melber, who's a very bright guy, yeah. he just may think because of how Moroccans look, yeah, or the yeah. Moroccans he saw look, yeah. Um, yeah. that they're Arab. Yeah. No, they're yeah. African. Yeah. Yeah. Each Egyptians are African. Yeah. Listen, we need to we need to orient ourselves towards the the geographical um, confines of the of the continent, yeah. and understand what countries are north of the Sahara. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Because people just think of Africa, they think of 
they think of Southern Africa, they think of Western Africa. Yeah. They may think of Eastern Africa. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, Morocco's yeah. a part of Africa. So I heard, I heard a report. Again, I'm driving. Um, <laughs> uh, this time, this time, um, I heard a name. I was like, wait a minute. I think that's the guy that's in um, the uh, short film called Redemption Song about Howard University. I don't know mm. if you've ever seen it, but no. there's a short film. Spike Lee was executive okay. producer, uh, but, um, uh, um, oh my God, right. Uh, what the, uh, uh, he's going to kill me. Um, but his brother that wrote uh, for The Athletic, he's done okay. some stuff with ESPN. Okay. Um, he uh, he was one of the producers. Mm -hmm. It's called Redemption Song, and it's about Howard University's soccer championships. Oh, okay. In 1971. That's right. When I was there. Matter of fact, first time I ever got on a plane, I was a freshman. Mm. Some kind of way, I scraped up the money for me and my girlfriend to fly to Miami to see these brothers that I had. And I, I was not a soccer fan. I was not a right. soccer player. But seeing this brilliant talent out on the soccer field at, at how, which they call the Dust Bowl, um, but the brothers from the Caribbean. Right, I and, remember and, that. And from Africa. Yeah. 1971, they won the first national title. They got invited to the White House. Mm. These are all really kind of bright guys. These ain't somebody, this is not somebody out right. there just in athletics taking bad mitten. Our, our Caribbean the Afro yes, intelligentsia. Yes. 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 So they yeah. got together as a team and decided, no, we ain't going to the White House. We ain't going to let, uh, uh, we're not going to let Richard Nixon wow. invite us to the White House and become a tool for him to try to reach out to the black community. That was their mindset. That was mm. their mindset. With in a fairly short amount of time, the NCAA g gave a ruling yep. that took the goddamn title from Howard. Yep. Now, we're like, that's bias, that's racism, that's whatever. Fast forward 40-some years, and we, con we finally get verification and connect the dots mm -hmm. to, the, to the Nixon administration's retaliation ah. for them not coming. Now, Redemption Song is talks about that. Okay. And it also talks about how scholarships were stripped away. They went to the tournament the next year, and Lincoln Phillips gave a speech that talked about, you didn't see Howard University playing tonight. You saw the remnants mm. of Howard University because of an unjust and an All unfair right. decision by the, by the NC2A. But in 1974, they won. They'd never lost. They didn't have any ties. And they outscored the opposition. Something like, I don't remember right. exactly what it was, but something like 60 to 10. <laughs> Domination. Uh, right. It's right, like they right. had whips and chains <laughs> right. up there. And then they went to play St. Louis, which was the perennial, the annual soccer champion. They were mm -hmm. the powerhouse in St. Louis in freezing temperatures and won their next championship in St. Louis, St. Louis's home, mm. in the fourth overtime. Wow. Is that part of the redemption song that's piece? Rede that's, okay. part, that's part of the redemption okay. song. You know Mike Wise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, when the 40th anniversary was coming about, I had given a speech at Howard saying, look, you don't need, we there all the time, right. and people are talking about, you know, we need inspiration. You need to look at uh, these, some of these other, Gonzaga, some of these other smaller schools right. and all that. I was like, look, so, I, so my speech was, you don't need to look outside of Howard for excellence. Right. You need it's to right look there. back. Y'all don't know right. nothing about that. And, right. and, and most of the people I was talking to wasn't even re didn't even realize Howard had won a national, right. two national championships. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. So um, somebody told Coach Phillips, and you know he called, and and, um, and I called Mike Wise. This man, this is 40th mm -hmm. anniversary coming up. Right. So Mike did a piece, and from there, you know. We talked about doing this film, right? And, and you, you, man, you got to take a look at it. It's a, now, I will the see point it. I'm like, making mm -hmm. is when I heard this name, it's like I think that was the guy. the The redemption song, weirdly enough, mm -hmm. starts with me talking. I okay. mean, I was a, okay. I was a fanatical, became a fanatical fan. 
And so for whatever their reason, they chose to, that I was talking. And then, you know, some of the players and the coach and all that. And then somewhere you see this white guy. So I'm like, why is Who's he talking <laughs> about this? What, right. what connection that, right. does he have? So I only found out his name. Mm -hmm. It's the soccer writer uh, who died. Oh, Grant Wall. Grant Wall. Grant, right. Yeah, Grant, Grant Wall. Wall. Mm -hmm. He's the guy. Ah, such okay. a, a And I only found out what authority he was. You right, know, what right, right. What authority he was After. on world soccer. Right. You know, on all, right. so on all soccer. And so before we leave from soccer, I called up, um, I cannot think of his first name. Mm -hmm. Right, 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 right. Uh, what is, I can't call his first mm -hmm. name. But I called him, I said, hey, man, were you the one that got Grant Wall in to do the uh, Howard piece? He said, mm -hmm. Rocky, I'm just devastated, man. He, the, brother, uh, the brother died. You know? right. I said, look, given that he wore the uh, rainbow shirt, right, right. Got, critic got, got, got stopped and crit right. criticized for that, right. he wrote a piece um, about uh, a Qatar and mm -hmm. their treatment of migrant workers. Right. I, init I immediately am suspicious. This mm. dude was, as far as I know, what I'm hearing, he said, man, I talked to him, whatever, two, three days before, right. or whatever. And he was, you know, Fine. said he had mm -hmm. some kind of little cold, but, right. you know, this dude was in good health, man. Right. And he wore that shirt because his brother is gay. Right. I said, I suspect foul play. And he, he said, he said it had to be. Now, mm. it doesn't mean it. Right, right, it right. It had to right, be. Right. But that's an unfolding story, man. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's a weird piece. I mean, I didn't know Grant. We crossed paths at, at World Cups a, a few times, um, but you know, he was really he's very fortunate in the sense that he got to dedicate his entire career towards writing about soccer, yeah. which he was passionate about from from uh, day one. Um, carved that out. That was his niche. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it is amazing. I mean, you can count. Um, I can count on one hand the number of full-time soccer writers at major uh, uh, newspapers during, during my career and in yeah. magazines. I yeah. mean, there's not, you know, a three-toed sloth could, yeah. could probably count them. Yeah. Um, so uh, he, he was very fortunate in, in that sense. And the game was fortunate that he was fortunate enough yeah. to be able to do that yeah. because it had somebody who continued yeah. like, like Stephen Goff at the Washington Post who has covered soccer. They've yeah. allowed him to cover soccer his entire career. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's a, it is a very I, I just, odd, odd I circumstance. Just, I, was, I, I was like, oh, how is this white guy? Yeah. But I was impressed with his handle mm -hmm. on the dynamics around those two victories. So right. obviously he was so steeped in yeah. it, you know. Yeah, and, I mean, he knew the... what a tragedy. Yeah, what he, a tragedy, man. Yeah, he, 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 he knew it. I mean, you don't, you, you know, you don't expect to, uh, uh, to go to uh, cover a sporting event and not make it, yeah. make it out. I mean, I, when, when, the, when the museum was, was in town here, um, they used to have a, a, a room dedicated or a wall dedicated to journalists who had fallen in, in their... Uh, in their practice, and I can only remember one sports journalist being on that wall. Yeah. Um, uh, if they ever open it again, now there'll be two. Yes, you yes, know? yes. Rest in peace. Rest in peace. Peace, good brother. Yeah, but that's an interesting, uh, that, that whole period you just mentioned, 71, 74, that's such an interesting and I think unexplored or re-explored part of D.C. history. Um, just that which went on at Howard University, things that were going on here in, in the city post MLK assassination uprising. People had fled the city. I know my parents did, moved out of Grant Circle just a couple blocks across uh, Eastern Avenue. Um, you know, that's when the, 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 the one season of the ABA team here that played at uh, uh, at uh, Uline Arena, U -Line Arena. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Rick Berry didn't want to come here. They had to yeah. drag him, kicking and screaming. Yeah. Um, Human Kindness Day, which I tell people about, they're like, "What are you talking about?" Human Kindness Day was like unbelievable. Like three Saturdays in a row, three summers in a row. Yeah. Um, just a lot of, just a lot of interesting um, history going on at that time. So I'll I'll share this with you, Kevin. And hell, you know, knowing you like I know you. 
you might take this and go somewhere with it. I, I don't okay. know. There might be a column one day, but <laughs> but here's the reality. So Howard, it would it would be real um, close to the fact mm -hmm. is that you got AKAs that hang with the AKAs and the Deltas that hang with the the the, the Deltas. And you got the football players that the, with the football players and the basketball players mm -hmm. and the baseball players. Right. And so by and large, I think without any necessarily intention, it would be real factual to say Howard was cliquish. Oh, yeah. You know, well, absolutely. You had you, no you, you had some kids who came there from, <clears throat> you know, family, very, very well to do right. families and some families who couldn't do it all. Right. <clears throat> and people hung with their kind. Mm, mm hmm Man, the excellence that took place on that football, on that on that soccer field. They call it right. the, it was the it was the Dust Bowl. Right. And I don't even know if one American was on. Might have been, but Caribbean and African. And of course, when I say African, Coach Phillips' job as a twenty nine year old. Mm who was a student at Howard. He, wow, he, he's a grad student. He, he, was, he was getting his undergraduate degree. He had played professional football, oh, but he was working to get his back. undergrad. He oh, was okay. in the class with some of the players. <laughs> wow. His job was to hold and mold these personalities into a unit mm. to be great. The, 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 um, the DNA of the team was not just speed, but speed demons. Mm. Oh, brother, they were so fast. Mm. They were so fast. And they developed a routine where they came out of the locker room and onto the dust bowl. Mm -hmm. And they danced and pranced like gazelles, like on the tips <laughs> of their toes. And they had their own unique routine, mm -hmm. like the Globetrotters had oh, sure. when, right, they right, right. Their, when they right. would do yeah, their yeah, circle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bro, man, so... There were standing ovations just for the warm, <laughs> just for the warm, just just for the warm ups. Yeah. That's how impressed. Forget class. Right. Wasn't nobody going to class, and one of the reasons nobody was going to class because the professors was out. There. <laughs> so man, there was a galvanizing effect. Yeah. <clears throat> Talking about we are one. That international unit mm -hmm. created a cohesiveness at Howard. Like nothing I ever saw before, mm -hmm. or have seen, or have seen since. And that's the and that's the power of sports. That that's is the, the power of that sports. That is the power yep. of sports. Yep. Brings people together and everybody pays attention. I talk about um, Kevin. I talk about being in the cheapest of cheap seats when Washington's football team, who had that filthy name, mm -hmm. played the Cowboys. When Dexter Manley mm -hmm. got to the quarterback oh, yeah. at one point, and Daryl Grant yep. intercepted the ball, ball, rumbles into the end zone, and waddled. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's waddled. Right. Yeah. So I'm in the cheap seats. There are a couple of things going on. One, I'm a little bit afraid because I'm like, is this place going to collapse? It was just like such such right. utter elation and bedlam. Oh yeah, great feeling moment, but. There was a silver-haired, blue-tam-wearing mm -hmm. white lady mm -hmm. who had very much of a British accent, interestingly enough, was sitting a couple seats from me. Mm -hmm. there, was a bro there was a brother behind her, big dude, who ever so often, he would break out of his bag some Jack Daniels. Oh, okay, sure. That was it back in the days. Man. Yeah. When <laughs> Daryl Grant scored that touchdown, she turned around, white lady she mm -hmm. being, and, and and hit him and said, give me a, give yeah, me a, of course. She took and put her lips on well, that Jack Daniels. Sport, sports. I don't know, I don't know, I yeah. don't know much if, of anything that can do that. No, no, a absolutely not. And I was fortunate enough to grow up in a family that had season tickets 
um, since before I was I was born. Oh wow! Yeah, I mean, my father wow. grew up in Lee Droy Park. Yeah, right, right in the right in the uh, you know in the shadow of Old Griffith Stadium and Howard man, University. Man, oh man! I, I, and I, I, uh, I had a home on uh, Channing Street for many years. There you go. Yeah. Well, he was yeah. his his house was Fourth uh, Street. Uh, okay. I want to say sixty twenty six Fourth Street is where he there it is is where he grew up. But I but you know one of the interesting things I just um, for the last eight years I've been working on a film. Um, about Native American mascotting. And it just premiered um, in uh, April, and we've been very fortunate. It's won some awards, and it's on the film festival circuit. Oh, wow. But <clears throat> when I was working on the film, um, uh, I, I was talking to my father. and uh, uh, Or not, I wasn't talking to my father. I was remembering some things that he had told me. Because before, I had written about the, the, the nickname, the name of the team. Yeah. Um, and I was writing about how uncomfortable I was with it and blah, blah, blah. And my father, who I used to call the epistolary activist, because he was always writing notes <laughs> to people and letters to the editor and all that kind of thing and, and, and guest editorials. Um, and so he, I'm home one time, and he goes over to his voluminous file cabinet, and he pulls out um, a brown, old brown file, and he hands it to me. And there are two letters inside of it, and it's from 1965. And one letter is from him to Edward Bennett Williams, who at the time was the acting president because... Yeah. Um, because uh, 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 acting president slash owner. Right, yeah. 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 Um, uh, and George, for, look, for y'all who hadn't didn't figured out, we're talking that, 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 that offensive name we're talking about. That's right. Redskins. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Exactly right. Um, so, and, and he and his friends had already boycotted the team. They yeah. were going to Baltimore games because because the team wasn't integrated. Uh -huh. So they'd finally come back. At any rate, um, the band used to play regularly Dixie. Dixie. Yeah. And so my father wrote, wrote, him a letter, wrote, wrote him a letter saying, hey, stop insulting Negro ticket buyers by playing a song of a defeated, dead um, yeah. <laughs> rebellion yeah. in this country that's an insult to us. Yeah. And it causes problems. And do you know what? Edward Bennett Williams wrote him back and said, thank you for bringing this to, this to my attention. Um, I'll take care of it. And they never played that song again. And the, Rock so that Newman just, show, the Rock Newman Show 2.0 Come by some my, history that you don't know nothing about. You Come by my but, office wow. and I got the, I got the letters uh, on my wall. Yeah. So it just reminded me that, that you know, you can make change. Yeah. Right? You can make change. And, yeah. it, and that's nothing... That's nothing radical. It's yeah. just doing the right thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, oh, man, so there's a, there's, there's a, lot, there's a lot for us to talk about. So I, I, I got some things. Let's just do it like this, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, I always tell people, um, <clears throat> I did a Facebook post. And... I, I, I was reminiscing, and I said, um, this is after the Nationals, around the time the Nationals won the title. And I said, you know, I remember being, I remember in college, I loved baseball so much, and I loved hitting. I just loved hitting. Mm. A personal aside, I still hold the career batting average for Howard University. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Yes. <laughs> all right. I was, I was on their first year inducted into their Hall of Fame. Congrats. Of all the right. athletes for that. all the years, they selected eight people. I was one of those. Cool. <clears throat> I like that. So, um, upperclassman, uh, Steve Powell, he was a senior. I was a, mm -hmm. I was a sophomore. And he knew how much I loved it, you know. So, he asked me one day. He said, man, if you could hit a rope every time you go to, for those you don't know what a rope, that's like getting all the ball, that getting is. all the bat on all the ball, popping them wrists and bringing up chart down the third baseline. I really hit more up the power alleys. But he said, um, if you could get a hit every time you went to bat for our 18 game season, mm -hmm. three months, right. three months, would you give up sex? <laughs> Now, this is when I'm 19 years old. <laughs> Would you give up sex for a whole year? It took me two seconds. I said, yeah. <laughs> I said, yeah. If I, if I could hit, that's how much I love baseball. So that's how much I 
I, uh, baseball is in my DNA. That's some love. Okay. With that being said, I want to that being the background to introduce this subject. You did a piece about sort of the pedestal that Aaron Judge was being placed upon for the New York Yankees and how everybody was rooting for him to break the home run record. All right. And, 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 and you correct me if I'm saying mm -hmm. it wrong, but how that was a form of disrespect. Absolutely. For Barry Bonds and the culprit, the culprit was Major League Baseball. Absolutely. And it's hypocrisy to recognize all the transgressions of those that went before Jackie Robinson. Can Absolutely. you talk to us about that? Well, um, nobody has done a better job at whitewashing history in sports than Major League Baseball. Mm -hmm. My hat is off to them. It is a tremendous job that they've done. Mm -hmm. They have turned Jackie Robinson into a reason for celebration as opposed to a reason to look at a 60-year period when they refused to let another progeny of enslaved Africans yeah. play baseball, yeah. right? right. Um, people still think today that Jackie Robinson's the first black Major League Baseball player. He wasn't. Yeah. It was Fleetwood Walker and maybe his brother, Weldy, back in the 18, 1880s until a guy by the name of Cap Anson, who was the greatest figure, most powerful figure in baseball in the 19th century, drew a color line and got everybody to join, stand it behind him. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, when you get to the home run record, um, you know, if, if you want to put an asterisk on Barry Bonds' record because of um, performance-enhancing drugs, then you better put an asterisk on every record that was set previous to the 1950s um, because those guys only played among themselves. That's right. That's right. And, uh, you know, I just went to Cooperstown for the first time um, uh, a few weekends ago. Um, and I don't know if you've ever been, but, you know, Cooperstown's in the middle of nowhere in New right, York. So right. you don't. Actually, I, you haven't, get, I haven't been. Okay. Yeah. So they, have a, they now have a section in there where they talk about the Negro Leagues and everything like that. And, and they, have a, there's a, they have a chart on the wall. And I've written about the information that's on the chart, but I've never seen it on the chart. And I was glad it was in, in the Hall of Fame. I wish it was in a little bit more prominent area. But what it did was it listed all of the achievements that Negro League players set once they got into the major leagues. Yeah. So from about 1948 until about 1962, you're talking about, you're talking about batting records, home run records, stolen base records, um, uh, Cy Youngs, MVPs, Rookie of the Years. Yeah. Black players just dominated that, yeah. which is an affirmation of how good they were, yeah. right? Yeah. And how you have to question um, all of all of these records yeah. that you talk about um, when the game was all white. Yeah. And not only that, but but the, the 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 pernicious part about what baseball did was that when it segregated itself, it was a leader. It, it was a a leading force in this country and a leading force in sports. Yeah. And so every other sport began to follow Major League Baseball's. Um, example, right, right, right. right I right, mean, we right. know what we we know what happened to Jack Johnson after he was give, became the first black man given the opportunity to fight for the heavyweight champion of the world. Mm -hmm. They came up with a law to, to basically crush him. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, all of the jockeys, the great the jockeys, dominated horse racing. Let, let, let me stop with Jack Johnson for yeah. a second, because if <clears> one <throat> if one can think and wrap their head around this, Jack Johnson defeated. Gentleman Jim Jeffries in Reno, I think that was 1906, dominated him. Yeah. Dominated him. And it exploded the inferiority of the white race. Absolutely. So much so until what did they do? They used 
the resources that they had, the connections that they had with government. Yep. And they burned and killed black people. people. It's unbelievable. All over this country. It was the it was the largest, most vicious race massacre that had happened in this country at that time. And over a fight. And look, you know, for those of you who might try to ignore or to say things weren't weren't that bad. Hmm. Please don't be so fragile. Please don't be so fragile that a bold, unmistakable, quintessential truth that you run away from it. Yeah. That's what happened. Jack Johnson yep. beat this man, showed his black superiority in the ring that night. Right. You saw that as an example of your inferiority and out of that inferiority your bestiality surfaced. Absolutely. And you beat and brutalized and burned and killed black people all over this country. You listen to me right now might not have done it. But oh, yeah. some in your so family did. Going back. Just be real and recognize it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that was that was an, an incredible piece of of history. But you know just following up on that NFL was integrated at the beginning. Yeah. Um, they segregated themselves. Basketball, had it not been for E.B. Henderson here, yeah. black people wouldn't have been playing basketball. Yeah. Um, uh, so, um, you know, Major League Baseball, um, their role, and I, th this, this is one of the things that always gets me as, as I start to really sit back and read about sports and study sports and talk to people who really study it. You know, we give sport um, an undeserved... We give it undeserved credit as a social change agent. Mm -hmm. um, sport, for the most part, has not been in the forefront of social change, right? It really has had its finger in the air, and then when it is economically or financially convenient, right. then it will shift. Yeah. It will shift gears. Yeah. But I always tell people, I said, in order for there to be a Jackie Robinson story. Something had to have happened beforehand. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, it, and, and, and I mean, <clears throat> and that is so modern. That ain't right. ancient history you're talking about. No. Because no, when Kaepernick takes a knee. Right. And how the NFL reacts. You know, it, it, I'm trying to think now when we're talking about baseball. Yeah. If you if we even see any dissent anymore in baseball. I mean, there is such, there is such oppression All right. that baseball players just seem like, well, I better not mess with that. I mean, I know I yeah. might not, I might, I, I might not get my opportunities. But we were, but we, uh, this started out with talking about Aaron Judge and, yeah. and, and your piece, right. Aaron Judge and uh, and, and Bobby, and Bar yeah, yeah, Barry Bonds, Bonds. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what, what, what was your central message there? Well, my central message is, oh, it's twofold. Number one, <laughs> we can see the numbers, yeah, all right? right. Uh, Barry Bonds is your home run leader. Yeah. Like him, hate him, whatever. Yeah. He set, he set the record. Yeah. Um, and if you want to disparage him because he came up in a, because he partook of, of the performance-enhancing drug error, um, okay. But that was an entire error. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I was there to cover it. I was there the night when um, when McGuire uh, put the ball over the left field wall in St. Louis yeah. to set that record that year, the single season record. Yeah. I was following him around. I was following Sammy Sosa around. Yeah. But do not ignore or do not continue to ignore a 60 year history of baseball in which it was only played among white men. Yeah. Because um, it, you, you have to, you know, if you're going to put an asterisk on anything, that's, that's the asterisk that, it, that deserves to be on something. Mm -hmm. And I used to get on the, um, I still get on Cooperstown about this. Um, uh, I told, I, I, I've written and I've talked to the officials there before about this. I said, you need to change Cap Anson's plaque on the wall. I said, because it is missing 
his most indelible mark on the game of baseball and sport overall. And that's the fact that he is the one who drew the color line and got everybody to follow him. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we don't change plaques. And I said, yes, you do. Yeah. You changed Jackie Robinson's plaque. Because yeah. Jackie Robinson's plaque originally just said he was this great baseball player. These are the numbers that he said. He led the team to, uh, to, the, to a World Series championship, blah, 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 blah. And then when they decided they wanted to start marketing the Jackie Robinson story, they edited his, his, um, his plaque to say that he broke the color barrier because yeah. that's what they want to talk about. Yeah. So um, it's just disingenuous to, uh, to, to uh, dismiss um, Barry Bonds. Uh, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's disingenuous because you accept the segregated era of baseball. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't have both. Yeah. Uh, just, just one thing, and maybe the audience is not so into baseball as, yeah. as, as it's we It's important might. to follow. Yes. <clears throat> but you're talking about bre breaking the records and, and blacks coming in and sort of rewriting the, oh, the record. Overnight. The record. Yeah. And when you talk about, you, you could, if you go to Maury Wills and the bases that he stole and Lou Brock and the bases that he stole yeah. and Ricky Henderson, the bases that he stole. Unbelievable. It's like these things are happening right. in this America's pastime sport where you just don't have, the other folks don't have anybody that can compete. Nobody. With, with, what, they, with what they do and, in and terms of their greatness and their skill. Right. And, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because Stolen Bain and Maury Wills, home, home, hometown hero. Yes. Um, you know, if you look at, like, after... I can't remember what year Maury Wills came in, but um, but at any rate, it wasn't more than two or three years after Jackie Robinson came into the game where the first black player set a season record for stolen bases. And since that time, I think there's been like maybe two white players. Mm -hmm. And one of them was, I think, it was oddly enough, it was like Craig Biggio during the strike, strike year or something like that. Yeah. So, I mean, just completely changed the game overnight. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> there's a lot lately that just puts that intersection we talk about oh, sports my goodness. and politics. Let's first go, and I would just like to get your full-throated mm -hmm. uh, thoughts and assessment. People are all over the place <laughs> with their love for or hatred of Neon, Primetime, <laughs> Deion Sanders. They all over the place there. That's right. That's right. Lord, he's got his detractors and he's got his folks that love and thought he did the right thing. What's your? How, how do you unpack that? Um, you know, I know Dion a little bit from the time he was with the uh, the Cowboys. Um, I knew him down there, and I've rarely been around a more uh, gifted athlete. I mean, this mm -hmm. guy is he's just he's just incredible. Mm -hmm. um, but. Yeah, yeah, to, yeah. Play, to play in an NFL game and, and then come and, then go, and can, can come hit a home run. And baseball, and yeah. amazing. I mean, right. just, just, yeah. just, just amazing. Um, but I'm glad you said neon. People forget that. Mm -hmm. They forget that that mm -hmm. part of it. Uh, and I'll just one quick anecdote, which will lead into this. Um, uh, when he first moved to Dallas, he he bought a house uh, way out in uh, North Plano, Texas, I believe it was. Um, and uh, he complained to the city council that people were driving by taking pictures of his property. And so he, he asked them if he could get, a, um, get the okay to put up a privacy fence. So they said, okay, you can do it. Um, so he puts up a privacy fence. It has a huge gate on the front of it. And you know what it said on the gate? Prime, <laughs> Prime time. time. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what this guy's about, right? He's a showman. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, one of the things he did at Jackson State was and no hating for him for this. Um, he generated interest in Jackson State, in, first of all, in Deion Sanders. Yeah. He's about Deion first. Yeah. yeah. Um, in Jackson State um, and in HBCU football. Mm -hmm. And more power to him, he figured out a way. He knew that he was a magnet for attention. Mm -hmm. And he, 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 did them, he did them well. I never thought that he was going to stay there forever. Remember people talked about he's not swack enough? Yeah. Well, he's not swack. Yeah, yeah. He went to Florida State, yeah, all right? He's right, not swack. Right. So this is not yeah. necessarily his, um, his thing. 
So the, to me, um, so I'm not, you know, I didn't go to an HBCU, although plenty of my friends did. Um, so I'm not mad at him for dipping his toe in and getting out because, because what he did for Jackson State, no one else could have, could have done for them. Now, I also point out Jackson State has a long and illustrious history when it comes to athletics. Yeah. Um, and Jackson State, people forget, when Kent State happened, Jackson State happened, yeah. right? Yeah. Kent State, white kids get shot down, protesting, became national, international news. Jackson State, black kids get shot and killed for protesting, and it was just local news. Yeah. I'm going to do a story just, off, just yeah. on that. I'm going to do a story. Kent State people got killed four dead in Ohio. Yep. People don't know of the massacre that took place at South Carolina State in Orangeburg, South Carolina. Orangeburg. Post, post, uh, 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 that's right. Cleveland, that's right. Um, cl uh, oh, what's people, Cleveland's last name? People uh, don't know. Henderson? Yeah. No, no. Um, uh, uh, it'll, 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 it'll come to me, but he's the only one from the Orangeburg um, shootout that wound up uh, getting prosecuted, convicted, and, and, and doing uh, yeah. uh, jail time. But one of those, you know, you talk about athlete activism. Yeah. One of the people who got shot and I think killed at Orangeburg was a football player, I think, a black football player. I've written about it before. So you talk about... And, 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 that, and for people who, who, who... For people who question, and a lot of people do, why you got to say Black Lives Matter? Four dead I, in on. Ohio. And a lot, lot, lot more dead in, at South Carolina State, black. And you don't know about it. Don't know about you it. You don't know about it because those, those lives right. had value. Exactly. The lives at South Carolina State did not. didn't have value. Didn't. No. That's why Black Lives Matter, black, the, the sign, the slogan. So important. Is so very important. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So I'm not surprised that, that he left. Um, and I understand the emotion in it. Um, Billy Hawkins, who... Um, uh, played football and is a professor down at uh, uh, University of Houston. Um, had some interesting comments about it. Uh, basically, he said that uh, that Dion's departure exposed the mythology about um, uh, about about black love for. HBCU institutions. And basically, I mean, basically saying to me, I think, is that, okay, now Dion's done this thing and he's left. Are you going to be there to step into this opportunity that he appears to have created? Mm -hmm. Right? Um, I mean, HBCUs have a, they got a Mount Everest to climb. Yeah. Um, but part of that climb comes from what alumni can do for their for their institutions. And I think, so I think now the onus is on, like, don't let the excitement that one person created for your, inst your team, your institution, and the organization of HBCUs in general, um, deflate your excitement and your love for that game at that institution um, that, that you are a part of. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I looked up, and, and this, it, it, this isn't always a good comparison, but I, I just looked it up anyway. Um, alumni giving um, at, at uh, Jackson State was something like, I think I saw, it's either, it's like 3.8%. Um, at HBCUs in general, it's about 10%. Yeah. And obviously there's some like Howard or Hampton or that are much, much higher. Um, and at all colleges and universities, it's like 28%. Yeah. So, you know, we need to um, step up to the plate mm -hmm. um, and don't let this opportunity. Look, why be mad about Dion coming in, doing something unquestionably good, and leaving um, when you can now spend that energy trying to figure out what he did and try to replicate it somehow, some way? Yeah. Um, that, that would be. You know, that would be my thing, but people are so upset that he, a lot of that he left. It's a lot, a, a lot, lot, lot of emotion. Lot, lot, and lot. This is a, 
this is a, we live in a capitalist system. <laughs> this is what you do. You capitalize on your opportunity. Well, Umar Johnson uh, was on the show with uh, Charlemagne, mm -hmm. Charlemagne, Charlemagne God. <clears throat> and he made a comment. Mm -hmm. He said he chose money over the movement. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. He chose money over the movement. Right. But, so when I hear that, I was like, yeah, that's a true statement. Right. But do you hold him accountable for being a movement leader? Right. He was a great player and he was a great coach. Right. He did a lot to help Jackson State. Had Absolutely. he stayed there. Right. Had he stayed there, I think he could have done a lot more. Absolutely. For Jackson State. And he could have done a lot more for HBCUs. Right, right. But who are we to judge an individual who makes that choice? We, right. can, we can say, okay, you're, you know what, man, Umar? You're right. He chose the money over the movement. Now, Dion is like, well, I haven't left. I mean, they, I'm going to be recruiting black kids right. here. That's a bit of a false equivalency. Right, 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 that, right. That's a bit right. of a false equivalency. But for Jackson State, he left them. He left them a. He left them a plate. Yeah. He left them a plate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, so, so, uh, you know, look at the fruits on those on on that plate, and and try and take that and use it to your, you know, to your advantage. Um, <coughs> so, I, you know, once again, you know, sometimes we get, um, and you're alluding to it here. Sometimes we get too. Uh, caught up in the individual rather than the collective. Um, and I think this is one of those, those cases. To me, the Dion Jackson State story is more about the inequitable educational system that we have, which sports just happens to be um, a part of, than about um, just about Jackson just State he, and or Deion Sanders and you know folks the, say you ain't never lied on that and we can look right here in Maryland which right we're in DC but yeah. right, right next to that the state of Maryland how they lost that huge lawsuit yeah and against had, that's right and had and, to pay and, huh and had to pay and had to and had to pay huge money right. so I mean the inequity it, is, and is you, astounding astounding and you remember a few <laughs> years ago when the uh, Grambling Grambling football players. Um, refused to play, yeah. uh, and they sent out some some pictures of um, their workroom and how shabby it was and everything like that. And there was a blowback, but the story wasn't a, just about the football team. It was about how Grambling was treated within the state, the the state higher education financial system of the state of Louisiana. Yeah. Right. The reason their their weight room was beat up was because they weren't getting their fair share of higher educational dollars from the state of Louisiana. So that's what, that's really what that, and that's what this, that's what this is about with, with, with Jackson State. Um, so people need to, they need to look at the larger picture and not just, and not just Deion Sanders in his three years or however long he was there. So you know they can't just wait. And I'm with them. I'm with them. To hear your take on Brittany Griner from, be, from beginning to end. From beginning to end. Well, I'll start at the end and just say uh, good for her that, that, that she's out. I mean, uh, you know, the last, what, month in a penal colony, who knows what could happen, would happen there. Not only that, in a country that, uh, it, that has uh, started a war. Um, with uh, a neighbor, um, uh, and who knows if that war could finally one day spread across the Russian border, um, and then she'd be in real peril. Um, so good that good that she's out. Um, but I will say, you know, I, I will say this, uh, and I don't think this has been focused on enough. <clears throat> um, Victor Boot, who was exchanged for Brittany Griner may be more responsible than any one individual walking planet Earth for violently destabilizing um, Southern Africa 
um, over the last 20 years. Uh, who knows how much his gun running uh, has cost in uh, black lives. Um, I mean, in, in, the, in the Republic of the Congo, in Sierra Leone, Angola, um, it is a long and bloody trail that he has in, that, that, that he has left among uh, indigenous black people in Africa. And so that, that for me is, is very, very troubling. So um, th this whole, you know, this whole situation has been troubling. But once again, getting back to underscoring the importance of sports, which, which you brought up, how many people knew about Paul Whelan until Brittany Griner? How many people knew about the other 60 Americans, some of whom are of color, being uh, held in uh, dubious circumstances um, around the world with uh, dangerous regimes. Um, nobody did. But Brittany Griner's stardom, worldwide stardom as an athlete, um, was a curse for her because it got her caught, and it was a blessing because she's not spending four years in a gulag like Paul Whelan is, who most people didn't know about. Um, you know, I wish she had never gotten herself in that in that in that quandary. Um, th th there's, you know, there was no reason her her wife had had, had asked her not to go back to to, to Russia. Um, uh, you know, she was pretty well healed, the first LGBTQ plus uh, athlete to get a million dollar endorsement contract from Nike on top of her um, uh, being uh, in the highest tier of. Uh, uh, of pay among WNBA players. Um, so she's not one of the ones that had to go to the Soviet, to, to Russia and, and play to make, to make ends meet. Um, uh, and I'll say this too, um, once again, this is when we have to look at ourselves. There are a lot of people out there talking about the salaries of WNBA players. And I love WNBA players. And I've been, a, I've bought a ticket to go see the Mystics, and I was there when they, when they won it. I volunteered to write a column because nobody else was available about um, when they won it. I've had Natasha Cloud in my class because she's, she's great, and Terry Jackson, who's the head of the, uh, 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 the uh, WNBA Players Association, is a, is a friend of mine. Um, but before you start, or as you demand more equitable pay and benefits for uh, women professional basketball players in the WNBA, Ask yourself, have you bought a ticket to go to their games? Do you have a season ticket package? Um, do you have a television package to watch them play? How are you supporting the league um, financially? Um, so it's on, it's, on, it's on all of us to uh, kind of ensure that um, women don't necessarily have to go um, reap more dollars by playing in these questionable places like Russia. As we wrap up, I want to make sure your comment about a, a film, play, documentary yeah. that you worked eight years on yeah. doesn't get lost in all. <laughs> oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Doesn't get lost in all the other conversations. I appreciate that. So tell me, tell, tell us about that. Sure. Um, what it is? Yeah. And you now say it's out, and you've gotten yeah, some. Out. You've gotten some awards. Yeah. And how folks can see it? Sure. It's uh, it's called Imagining the Indian: uh, The Fight Against Native American Mascotting. Uh, we premiered out in California in April. We were here at the DC Film Festival. I think that was in April as well. Uh, we won Best Documentary at the Boston International Film Festival. Um, we won uh, Best Documentary at the uh, Human Rights Film Festival in Atlanta that's held at Morehouse. Um, we've been all over the place. We played the Kennedy Center. We played uh, the Field Museum in Chicago just uh, earlier this week. Um, and we're in the midst of putting together a, um, uh, or, or signing a uh, educational distribution deal and then hopefully a theatrical distribution deal. Um, uh, right now, if you, if you, uh, right now we are leasing it to uh, educational institutions. Mm -hmm. um, and we hope to have it, you know, we hope to get a streaming deal um, uh, early part of next year. Much, much needed work. You know what? I, it would be, you know, my, my audience would, would, would Facebook slap me or, or social media, <laughs> social media slap me if I didn't bring this up. Um, man, Caleb Williams, 
From, Finally! From D.C., from Finally, the DMV. From the DMV. Just won the Heisman Trophy. First ever. Gotta love it. I, I, you know, and it's, uh, it's so many good football players we've had from here. And uh, to think that he's the first one and he had to do it going to USC. But, but um, good for him. I mean, when he burst onto the college scene, I mean, if anybody saw him playing around here at the Gonzaga, he was great. Yeah. Um, but he came on, I want to say in the, he came on for Oklahoma uh, in relief of Spencer Rattler in the big Oklahoma Texas game, right. and just yeah. just lit the field up. Yeah. And then he follows Lincoln Riley, his coach from Oklahoma, out yeah. to USC, yeah. and they turn that program uh, yeah. back in the right direction o- overnight. And he is he's spectacular. You know what, man? Years ago, not so much now, mm-hmm. but years ago, there was a pro- proliferation of t-shirts, sweatshirts, caps, whatever. Say, you wouldn't understand. It's it's a DC 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 thing. thing. (laughs) You wouldn't understand. So it was just some comments kind of across the board Uh about Caleb Williams having swag. (laughs) And you know what, man? We all know what that means. Absolutely. We felt that, and and we might not even be able to describe it. No. But we precisely knew what it meant. Oh, absolutely. And I'll tell you something else about swag. So, um... Dwayne Haskins, um, uh, there was a story when he was drafted here yeah. um, that uh, Joe Theismann had granted him the number seven. Okay. And that's what he wanted. Mm-hmm. And that's great. Yeah. And I know Joe. That's great, Joe. Yeah. But that's not why he wanted number seven. Yeah. He wanted number seven because of the number seven that preceded him from Washington, D.C. at Ohio State. Uh-huh. Cornelius Green. Cornelius Green. Cornelius Green. Absolutely. Flame. You yeah. talk about swag. Yeah. That oh flame was swag. Oh, my God. From Dunbar? <laughs> From Dunbar. Man. Used my, to wear tassels on his socks brother, in high school. <laughs> my girlfriend was getting her masters at Ohio State <laughs> while Cornelius Green was playing. There you go. And I went there and saw that crimson. That was the, <laughs> man, 100,000 people in that stadium. It was beyond Phenomenal. But uh, congratulations, uh, Caleb Williams, and to, and, and to your family. Yeah. Brother, thank you so thank much, you Kevin, this is for great. joining. Man. We can do this another two hours. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. Thank you so much, folks. Thank you. That's it. A little bit of sports for your sport itself. Thank you for watching The Rock Newman Show 2.0.